Testing, 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 one, two, three. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this another session of Soul Therapy Live broadcast. I am your host. I want to say the Reverend Dr. Andre L. Martin, but that is so old school. My name is Pastor Martin. How's everybody doing? Welcome on this particular evening. Um, a couple of um, quick announcements. First of all, Jesus is real. I know he is real to me. That's the first announcement. And the second announcement is, is that Every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m., we have um, our Bible study. And on next Wednesday night, we will be having our My Time with God podcast and the like. And so if you have some time to come on out, you either just mute the, the computer output 11 or 12 for you or later. Um, and so if you are, have some time to come on out, make sure that you do. Um, I was reading something just the other day about um, the, 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 the state of the church right now in regards to serving. And a lot of times people want leadership positions in the church, but they're, they are not present within the body. And that is one of the key things oftentimes when it comes to um, how I look at leadership is that your presence is needed it's, and it's felt, it's, it's, it's necessary. And so a lot of times... Um, Crucial evenings like this, especially when it's time for you to learn and for you to grow, it's it's paramount that you feed your soul with the right things, not just on Sunday mornings, which is typically inspiration, but typically on Wednesday nights, which is really about instruction. And so every third Wednesday, we're going to have my time with God, prayer time, starting at 7 o'clock p.m. And then after that, we'll move on to our podcast. But for right now, we are going to get into the word of the Lord. And so this evening's scripture is going to come from out of John chapter 3, verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. And as that's being pulled up, um, don't forget that this upcoming Sunday at 1030 a.m. is our normal service. If you cannot come in person, make sure that you watch online. I think that from what I see out there in the marketplace, there is um, um, the level of safety has returned. Um, in large part, people are still going where they need to go, but we want to also extend that to the body of Christ as well. So make sure that you don't put God, God last. We pray for him and pray to him. I mean, we pray um, to him on a regular basis, but we don't want to take things from him, which is presenting our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So let's make sure that we put things in priority. Um, we're not here to just do things online only, but would you need you in the house of the Lord? It's kind of hard to just exhort you um, just online only. So let's make sure that we stay balanced, we do what you need to do. It shouldn't be only as a um, preferable alternative. It should only be used if you cannot come. Okay, that's one of my criteria for leaders. Leaders, you need to be in the house of the Lord on a regular basis on a regular basis unless something else is hindering you from coming. Otherwise, you don't need to be in a leadership position or you don't need to jockey for a position because Sundays is really, as Bishop McLaughlin would say, anticlimactic is what you do during the week that is true ministry. John 3.16 is that those follows. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I have a question to each and every one of you while we're in in the house on this particular evening. And that is after I give the title for this evening's message. Subject for tonight is what do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? What do I have to lose? The assurance 
of salvation. So I got a question. Here's the question. What is a promise that either you have made or someone made to you that fell through or was not completed? In other words, what is a promise? Can anybody remember a promise that you made that didn't fall through? Anybody in the back? Have you ever made a promise and you didn't, weren't able to keep it? Has anyone made you a promise and it wasn't kept? Right. I've, I've dealt with people but, um, both in church life, family life, that um, have kept promises. And I've also had people in church life, family life, business life that have also broken promises. And I have as well. Um, somebody has a certain technique to where when I said, you promised me that you will, they wouldn't even make a promise because they know that, you know, as humans, we, we sometimes don't always do what we say that we're going to do. You know, we try, but the only person that was perfect on the planet was Jesus out of all the creation. Everybody else falls way short. So let me give you a quick illustration. Also, could y'all turn the air on in the back as well? They're trying to smoke me out again. So here's the illustration. A woman was sick in the hospital with cancer. A pastor went to visit her and realized that she was a believer but lacked the assurance that she would go to heaven when she died. The lady had chosen to trust in the Lord Jesus for her salvation and had invited him into her life but she had no peace in her heart. Believers who aren't certain of their relationship with Jesus aren't going to have the fullness of joy, nor are they prepared to freely and fully serve the Lord. We should not be satisfied, that is, until we know without a shadow of a doubt that we're children of the Most High God and our internal destination, our final destination, is heaven. However, albeit and notwithstanding, what does the word of God say about this? And before we get into that scripture that's going to come from out of Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the reason why things like this are, are so important is because many of us grew up in faith tra traditions that were either on one side of the fence or the other. On one side of the fence, it's once saved, always saved. And then the other side of the fence, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And that you could lose your salvation. And they take script certain scriptures out of context, and they look at things such as, well, if Amanius and Alexander, they were shipwrecked in their faith, and apostasy and things like that. All of those things begin to make you wonder if you're going to stay saved. But Revelation chapter 3 gives us a clue into our assurance, a blessed assurance in regards to this topic. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, A promise of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Think of the door as your heart. And if anyone hears my voice and opens their heart or the door, I will come in to him or her and will dine with them, fellowship with him and he with me. So this is a promise of God that if your heart is open up to the message of the gospel, that he will enter in and do a work. The question that is also necessary here is, is there a situation to where the person opens up the door, or is it God? Who opens up the heart? Is it man, or is it God? When you come to church, and I've seen this illustrated over and over again, it's just like people who think that because their dad was a pastor, that they're in a line of preachers, therefore they should preach too, and that, or, that because mama went to church, that the children's salvation has been inherited. And that could not be further from the truth. The truth of the matter is, is that 
when you have been transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ, God does it according to his purpose and his plan. And when he saves you, it's like a person, as the scripture says, whoever the Father has put into my hand, no one can pluck out, not even you. No one can pluck you out of the Father's hand. The Father places the soul of a man into Jesus' hand. A man or a woman does not place themselves in the hands of the Father because the default state of man, be it agnosticism, flirty with atheism, Buddhism, any other religion out there, the religion of all, the religion of some, is that we, by default, do not want to be around godly things, do not want to hear godly things, do not want God. We can be in the building, but just because you're in the building does not make you a Christian. You are a Christian by tradition of your family lineage. But how many of y'all have had family members and kids that just want to stay home? Right? I wanted to stay home too. I did not want to be there. And it wasn't because what the messages that were coming from the pulpit were bad. It wasn't being abused by no preacher, no teacher. I had no deacon that was pinching me um, on my arm. My mama did that. <laughs> none, of the, none of those things happened. I just didn't want to be there. I wanted to be in a sinful world. I felt at home in the world. I felt out of place at church. I felt comfortable in sinful things with riotous living, but in, but, but, but in church I felt uncomfortable. Bishop McLaughlin said so poignantly years ago that pigs wallow and sheep struggle. What is the thing or the area that pigs wallow in? Slop. Okay. They wallow in slop. And if they're wallowing in slop, that slop represents sin. So people who are of the world and that are not saved wallow in, enjoy the slop. Just like the prodigal son. The prodigal son belonged to the father. The father loved him, but the prodigal son went away for a moment in time and was wallowing in pig slop until he came to himself and he remembered that the father was there waiting for him. Now, what made the man who was in that slop come to himself? Was it his realization? No. He didn't decide that, hey, it's time for me to go back. He had to get sick of sin, but the sickness that you have when it comes to sinful things, that repulsive, that I don't want to do that any longer, that comes when you hear or you remember the father's call. But it's the father that has called. If he never called, you wouldn't go. So when a person comes to themselves, they realize that, hey, it is God that called me unto salvation. The prodigal son then runs back to the father, guilt-ridden, thinking that he does not deserve to be in the presence. But then the father says, go bring me the fatted calf. Let me go ahead and take a ring and put it on your finger, finger, the signet ring, denoting that he has ultimate authority. Can y'all turn off that center light, please, because it's just flashing green in the back center, please. And so all of these different types of things were happening on a, on a regular basis. And when he gave him the ring, the fatted calf, and then a robe, all of this stuff, he was like overwhelmed because he did not expect for there to be such good treatment after he was wallowing and slop or excuse me, sin for all that time. Same thing with the prodigal daughter, Gomer. All of the men that she was playing the harlot with, Hosea even divorced her. They separated themselves for a period of time, just like the prodigal son separated himself from the father for a period of time. Gomer separated herself from the husband. Who's the husband of the church? It is Jesus Christ. We are, he is the bridegroom to the church. In the Old Testament, Israel is married to God. In the New Testament, the church is married to Jesus. So we see the parallels there. So it wasn't Gomer that wanted to go back. Gomer was found there on a rock. One of the original 
individuals in the biblical text that we see outside of all the concubines that was a part of the sex trafficking world at that time. She was being sold as a sex slave and Hosea knew that she was used and abused but still he had pity, he had compassion and he didn't get her for free, he had to pay a price and they were trying to outbid because they knew of her exploits out there in the streets. She was for the streets. But still, Hosea said, you know what? I love her. We have children together. We had a blended family. And the children were not his. They never had any natural children together. She actually had children prior to them getting married. But he said, we have children together. And he paid a high price for that woman's vessel. They remarried. And he didn't bring up all of the things that she went through, be it intentional or not intentional. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful display of God's grace and salvation, both in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. Things that we do not think that we deserve, but yet here we are partaking of it. So when God makes a promise, he's going to keep it. He promised to come in. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 through 13 also says the following. In verse 11, it says, He answered them, saying, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that particular place. And this is in 1 John, not John. 1 John. 1 John. I apologize, everybody. So I'm going to read it to you on my own right here. And it says, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. And that's still a good verse. If it's the word, no problem. Just take that and put you in the pocket for another message. Repeating, and this, and the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Whom, he who has the son has the life. He who does not have the son does not have the life. That sounds kind of rough right there, doesn't it? It sounds a little bit rough. Because it seems like it's not inclusive, because you know that's kind of like the buzzword for today, but it's actually exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I love that statement because of its exclusivity. It is heresy to think that everybody and all dogs are going to heaven. <laughs> That is simply not true. Even though you love Poopsie, you love your cousin, them, Pookie, Ray Ray, whoever it may be, Shaniqua and all the rest, if they're not his, then they can't go home with him. At whether my kids are having good days or bad days, whether they are getting along or not, at the end of the day, they're coming home with me because they are mine. That's a wonderful display of love. I think I was in a conversation with one of my kids just recently, and I was basically telling the person that regardless of what goes on, even if there are certain times where I may be hurt by a comment, or annoyed by a conversation, that will not stop my love for you. There's nothing that you could do that will turn my heart sour to the moment to where I'll say, I don't love you anymore. You're no longer my son. I would never disown my sons. No matter what they got going on, I would never, ever disown them. I would be disappointed I would distance myself if they were wallowing in sin, but I would never disown them. And the prodigal son was such a one, just like Gomer, to well, 
they thought in their own eyes that they should have been disowned, but they were not. If you don't have Jesus, then you can't have a relationship with the Father. If you don't have a relationship with the Father, catch this, then you won't understand the leading of the Holy Spirit. If you are not led by the Spirit, then if you try to read the Bible void of all of those things, it will not make sense because it is a spiritually driven book. It is God breathed. And if you are not his, then you don't have his breath in your lungs. Another point that I want to share is that people who have Jesus living in them, again, possess eternal life. That's the main point of the verse. So now let's go ahead and go to 1 John chapter 5, verse, 5, verse 13. 1 John, not John, 1 John. Chapter 5, verse 13. And this is the moment of time when we need to look up. And it says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have, not might, but that you have, not perhaps, <laughs> but that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, which is Jesus. Let's look, if you will, at the verse and note that the present tense, our Heavenly Father wants you to know that you have eternal life. Have. Not had. Had means, <laughs> ooh, if it said had, ooh, that, yeah, you had eternal life, but it's gone now. You were tripping. You were going places that you weren't supposed to go. You, know, you said on the way out the door, I got people to see, places to go, and heads the bus. Bottles to turn up, dropping it down low, whatever it is. Hey, if I'm going to go to hell, I'm going to go to hell in style. And sometimes we flippantly say that. I see people on Facebook say that all the time. I know I shouldn't be doing this because I know I'm going to hell if I do this. And people flippantly say, well, I'll be there right there with you. You do not want to go there. It's not even made for you. However, the one thing that you need to know about such a bad place is that everybody who's there deserved it. Our justice system that is man-made oftentimes does not get it right. I was just looking at a Facebook post about how these two individuals who are part of the show Mythbusters actually <laughs> was able to exonerate somebody from prison because of their busting of a myth. The individual was convicted because the authorities thought that he flicked a cigarette that was to ignite a Molotov cocktail. But the myth busters, because you know that's how people do it in the movies, they take that cigarette and then throw it, and then all of a sudden the flames just go trailing all over the place, and then <laughs> But the myth busters, the truth tellers, replicated that. That's what we're told oftentimes in IT and information technology. Whenever there's a problem that a customer has, especially if it's a deep problem that's not surface level, we are told as a best practice in our training to, to the customer that, please, is there a way that you could replicate the issue? Can you try to click on the button again? Let me check the logs and let me see if we could do some tracing to see if we could get down to the root cause of the issue. So the Mythbusters took the cigarette, several of them, and tried to ignite a Molotov cocktail. And suffice to say, all of their blind testing, all of their bias, their sample, came up with no good results. And the person who was in prison, I don't know how they saw this channel on cable TV, but they saw it, and they presented it as evidence before the parole board, and now the man has gone free. See, our justice system, like that, is full of flaws. And people study to be a part of a flawed system with the hopes that hopefully individuals that go into legal profession will continue to practice good ethics so that true justice will be served. But even with those great hearts, 
Sometimes it's not the case. Ha, but, but, but when it comes to God's justice, his is always right. Those, this is the part that boggles the mind. Both groups of people, people who go to, <laughs> go to hell deserve it. People who go to heaven don't deserve it. You do not deserve to be in heaven. None of us do. But the reason why we can go is because of Jesus Christ. And it's because of his sacrifice that makes those that are unworthy, unreliable, unrepentant at times, cantankerous with all of our buffoonery and acts and sinful ways, whether it's the sin of you doing things or the sin of you just not doing anything at all. And there's a lot of people who don't do nothing and they think that they're all right. With all of that, God still says, I got you. You have blessed assurance. Jesus, he, he, he's yours. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Hair of salvation, perfect in love, born in the spirit, washed in this blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, my testimony. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. You have eternal life, not had. As I move on from here, notice again that had doesn't mean hope, think, wish, suppose, or dream. It says have. Now let's go to the book of John, regular John, not first John, regular John. Chapter 6, verse 47. And it says, most assuredly, what the KJV says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. That sounds pretty straight, right? We have it. There's no wishing, no hoping here. We have it. Our Lord's words couldn't be any clearer. So I do think in my Baptist voice <laughs> that once you saved, you are always <laughs> saved. Yes, it is true. Because who remember the Father has placed in Jesus' hands, no man can pluck it out. No man cannot hinder me. Right on, King Jesus. No man cannot hinder me. Right on, King Jesus. Right on, no man cannot hinder me. No man can tell you that you ain't saved no more. Now, sometimes people act a fool. They act a donkey. They act crazy. But God still loves them. You just happen to see them in the prodigal state or the gomer state. So what about those times when I don't feel like I'm that saved? I don't really feel like, <laughs> you know, kids, okay, kids, newsflash. Sometimes you don't feel like you <laughs> are, are your parent's child, <laughs> especially when they exact punishment or correct you. I know, I know for sure my sons feel that way sometimes. Are you my dad? Because you treat me like a stranger in this house. <laughs> I can't believe that you're gonna go to leverage these things against me like, and I felt the same way about my dad. I was like, I remember one time, and I'm so glad that my mama didn't hear me. When I was little, after my mom tore my butt up for being disobedient, I said, you a junkie lady. I said, junkie, you a junkie lady. She said to me, what? And she went right outside and took all them leaves off of that plant and wore my butt out. Well, no, she did that beforehand. And I said, you a junkie lady. But then after that, when, I, when she said, what did you say? I said, nothing. <laughs> I didn't get in trouble because I didn't get caught. But I think she heard me. She just let us lie. I didn't feel like I was her child at that moment because I didn't want to get punished for something that I had caused. But here I am, still her child. She still sends me text messages with a whole bunch of stuff even to this day. And I cherish every moment of them because I know that one day they will stop. They will stop. But yeah, Davia, Jose, Lady Martin, Jeff and the rest, sometimes you feel like a nut, and sometimes you don't. 
sometimes you feel like you got all of the spiritual anointing, and other times you don't even want to be in the house of the Lord. You don't even want to pray. And sometimes the enemy tries to validate those feelings as well. However, it doesn't change a thing regarding to our destiny. It's not our feelings that settle the issue, but rather the facts of God's word. Let me give you an illustration of a train to show the proper place of feelings. So if you could at home or you could just take out a piece of paper, draw a picture of a train comprised of an engine, that would be first, a coal car, and a caboose. That's on the very end. The engine represents faith which is inspired or fueled by the coal car which are the facts or promises of God's word, and the caboose is the feelings. We should not be led with our feelings, but with our faith. Faith is the engine that pulls us ahead. Our feelings are just going to go along for the ride, and it has no power to pull the train along. It can slow it down, significantly and sometimes it could even stop progress but if that faith is being filled on a regular basis then it'll pull everything right along where it needs to be faith over fear faith over feelings faith should not be based on feelings but on the word of God so my dear brothers and sisters move ahead in faith based on the promises of God and the feelings will follow this is the reason why in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A lot of people hear my voice, but very few believers or folk listen. One of the main challenges I had oftentimes in sports is, is <laughs> sports and even when I was um, a pledge G for Sigma years ago. Y'all want to know what my line name was when I was um, going through as a pledge G um, while I was a Sigma? And it was H U H, or huh? And I believe that God has a sense of humor because when I talk to my sons about things, they always say, huh? Like profusely. I think that might be theirs too, <laughs> one day. But it was always, huh? Because I was trying to process. <laughs> <laughs> what they were saying to me at a rapid pace, and I would fail miserably. What? It's like my son right now, he's in this thing right now, he says, what? Well, before he said, what? There was a huh, and that was me. Hearing is different than, you know, listening. But this type of hearing in the text is talking about true active listening. Like, ladies, you know this to be true, right? Like on Monday nights and sometimes on Sundays, after church, when your husband or your significant other is watching the game, or the kids are playing their video games, and you say, hey, I need you to do this, and they just keep on playing. And they've gotten so slick nowadays to where they have extra padding in their ears, right? So like, if my son's like to put on hats, hoodies, and earphones all at the same time, and lock their door. But thankfully, they have a father that could still go up them steps. And I still got a thumbnail that could open up that lock. I bust into the room like a madman saying, hey, how y'all doing? And I take off all the earplugs and all the other stuff like that. Hey, 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 you need to come downstairs and do them dishes. Did you hear me? Yes, sir. And they come on down. Sometimes. <laughs> and I did the same thing as well. There is a difference. Sometimes I don't listen to Lady Martin. I hear, and she can always tell when I'm not listening because I'm not being active in my response. She knows when I'm engaged, and she knows when I'm not engaged, and God does too. God does too. So what is the nature, as I close, of saving faith? Well, number one, it's not just head knowledge or being smart or knowing that Jesus existed. Apologetics does not save anyone. Apologetics or knowing the facts and figures about the historicity of Jesus, you know, the, the origins of the text, Council of Nicaea, all of these different types of things that you read line upon line 
all online, all the other stuff like that, and you can provide all of the evidences, it's still an exercise in futility. Because your words don't save a person. It is only God who opens up the door to our hearts that does. When he does it, don't know. How he does it, it's unique to each individual. But that he does it at all is an absolute miracle. It's a miracle. Let me give you another illustration. Suppose I ask a man, do you believe in communism or Marxism? If he answers yes, that can apply one or two things. That number one, he might mean that he believes communism or some other type of ism exists, or he might mean that he is a communist or Marxist, whatever it may be, or racist. What an enormous difference. You know racism exists, but that doesn't mean that you are one. You get the point. Faith or believing the truth that God exists or that Jesus lived and died does not make a person a Christian. Did y'all get that? Faith or believing the truth that God exists or that Jesus lived and died doesn't make a person a Christian. I think that's where a lot of people get it twisted. Your attendance does not make you a Christian. And for all my folk that are at home right now multitasking with the computer, and this after hours now, so while you're multitasking, looking at the computer and listening at this moment in time, please know that you staying at home doesn't make you better than folk here. Because now we flip the exclusivity. Now the country club is at the house. And now people think that because they stay home that they are spiritually deeper than those that are in the house of the Lord. But no man is an island. No man is an island. You can't exhort yourself because many of us got ourselves in trouble without anybody's help. <laughs> so, as the text says, even demons believe that Jesus came, lived, died, and was buried and rose again on the third day. So the devil has the utmost assurance that God exists. Let's prove it in the text in James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So they know that God exists academically. But while they know that he exists, and while they believe that he exists, they have no fellowship with him. To believe or trust in Christ, Jesus, is of the utmost importance. In this particular text, they certainly aren't going to heaven because they neither love him or dedicated to him. The devils, it, it doesn't matter that they know that he exists. And also, to believe or trust in Christ is to love him and to place our whole life into his care. It's an act of the will. The will of God. Another illustration here. And I'm going to get a chair. Brother Jose, could you give me that chair really quickly, please, sir? Thank you. I appreciate it. So I'm going to give you a true stark example that's revolutionary, that's mind-boggling. Let me give you a key example of what it's like to rest in Jesus Christ. That's it. It feels comfortable. My back feels a hundred times better because I call myself trying to be fashionable with these shoes that have no cushion in them. <laughs> I need cushion at my age now. I could relax. I could contemplate things. And I could probably sit here for quite some time. The chair represents our faith in Jesus Christ and that we should rest in him, not in ourselves. If we just try to stand on our own two feet, we're going to break down, we're going to get weary, and we're going to get tired of doing such things. But resting in God is of the utmost importance. Have you ever been standing up so long? I remember in the old Baptist church, we used to stand up so long 
So long. I'm like, oh, goodness. We had to go through the responsive reading. Y'all remember responsive reading? Read. <laughs> I know Elder Winston know that. <laughs> and half of us couldn't even read. We were just repeating words. <laughs> thou hath knoweth. And it was the King James Version. Thou knoweth. It is, or it is, it is, it is welleth with it, my soulleth. And we standing up there. And then we have another selection by our choir at this moment in time. And then after that, another selection. And we just ready to sit down. This is not that. This represents the rest that we should have in Jesus Christ. And we need it. I know I need it. Because your boy be tripping sometimes. And I need it because there's no one on this planet that can give me rest like Jesus. Somebody give the chair a hand clap of praise. Give me. Hey. Thank you. I'll be needing you again in the future. I won't pay you anything, though. So as I conclude here, our response to God should be one of love and gratitude for what Christ has done for us. The president of Princeton who said, when I realized that Christ or what Christ had done for me, the rest of my life was like a PS saying thank you for what you did for me. If you are trusting in Christ, as I close here, as your personal savior, and if this faith results in sincere love for him and commitment to him, then our Heavenly Father wants you to know that you are his child. And if you should die today or pass away from this earth, you will, without a shadow of a doubt, go to be with him in heaven. Remember, a good father doesn't leave his children behind. A good father takes his kids home with him every time. They may stay somewhere else. They may have families. And they may go maybe many months or many weeks without speaking. But we always know where home is. May you have that blessed hope as well. Please remember, people of God, if this is the case for you, then go in the joy of the blessed assurance. Go with the knowledge that your eternal destiny is fixed. And if you don't know, pray that God shows himself strong in your life, asking God to allow for Jesus to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins and trusting and yielding your life into his care. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you and we honor you. Many of us are asking the question, what do I have to lose? In this world, it could feel like you're losing everything. But with Jesus Christ, as far as your salvation, your seat in heaven, you will lose nothing. Your, your ticket to heaven is not revoked. It is still intact. Regardless of where you've been or where you're going, it is still intact. So, Father, I thank you and I bless you for these, your people. I thank you for the sweet spirit that permeates through this place for a message that is so point, poignant and important at this very hour. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Good night. Take care. Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Andre Martin, and I hope that you enjoyed the message on today. Listen, I would like to invite you and your family to come on out and worship with us at Divine Truth Christian Center. We are located at 350 Anchor Road, Suite 1050 in the beautiful city of Castleberry, Florida. I would love to meet you. I would love to be able to hear about what's going on in your life and make an impact. Again, come on out, visit us. We start at 10.30 a.m. on Sunday mornings and also on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock p.m. for our Soul Therapy Live Bible Study broadcast. You don't want to miss it. Other than that, don't forget, love God. Love people.